Hi, I'm Paul Alexander. I'm an administrator here at Hope International University. And I'm a former faculty member. I've been here 25 years. The first 16 years I taught in our psychology area. I'm also a licensed marriage family child therapist and have been licensed for about 30 years. So even though I spend my time as an administrator, I still have a heart for counseling, pastoral counseling, but I especially have a heart for pastors and the issues that they face. As an ordained pastor myself, it's always been close to my heart, the work that you all do, how challenging that work can be, and how, at times, isolating that work can be. About six months ago, we had a couple of tragedies in our area here in Southern California that really rocked the world of churches and pastors and parishioners alike. Within a couple of months of each other, about 60 miles apart, pastors at two different churches were so depressed and so worn down that they each took their own lives. Now, anytime that happens, it's a tragedy, but it's especially confounding, upsetting, and confusing when it's a pastor. Pastors, I think, are held to a higher standard, and people think they shouldn't have those kind of problems. Pastors, yourselves, sometimes think that they shouldn't have these kind of problems, and yet we know that we all have issues related at times to depression or anxiety or relationship problems. I think it's just harder to talk about for pastors. So this resource, this series that we put together is for you. I hope it is a gift to you, to your staff, and for you and your loved ones. I simply ask and pray that as you begin this journey the next few minutes, that you would be transparent with yourself, that you would be open to answering the questions that I'm gonna ask, not overinflate, not devalue, but just honestly, as I ask you some questions. Many years ago, just about 30 years ago, for about two and a half years, I was the director of pastor relations for a really well-known at the time, really well-known Christian mental health company. They didn't last much beyond that time frame, but I was there sort of in the heyday of Christian mental health hospitals. And my role is to put on seminars on the West Coast, but also to be the pastor helpline guy. So I was on the receiving end of calls from pastors. And one thing I learned during that two and a half years is that pastors would usually wait until they were very depressed or very anxious before they would make that call simply because of embarrassment. They didn't want to admit to their elders, they didn't want to admit to their staff that they were struggling, and so they sort of suffered in silence. And that has stayed with me all these years. I don't do a lot of clinical work anymore formally, but informally I support churches behind the scenes to do what is called EAP, Employee Assistance Program and Help. And I don't get paid for that, it's just something that I provide to come in for a very short period of time and to help people when they're in a time of crisis, whether it's relational, or a crisis like depression. Now I'm not, trying to <laughs> I'm not trying to get business, I'm just telling you that I have stayed close to this issue for a very, very long time and have put this together for you. So let me start with a question. And the question is this, how many Americans do you think are depressed at any given time? So in all of America, adult population, what percentage of Americans are depressed today? So think of a number. When I did this recently at a large church, I heard numbers anywhere as low as 20% and as high as 70%. A lot of numbers around 40% and 50%. So here's the answer based on stats from the CDC and the National Institute of Mental Health. Pretty consistent number the last five to 10 years. The answer is lower than you might think. The answer is 6%. 6% of Americans today, adults, are classically, technically, and medically depressed. That means in your church of, hypothetically, a thousand, next Sunday, you'll have 60 people walking in with clinical depression. Now, I'm a visual person, so I imagine 60 people walking in with big backpacks full of rocks or weights. They may smile, they may look good, they may be very engaging, but they are really struggling. 6%, true across the board. Second question, what percentage of uh, American pastors are depressed? That's a trick question. We don't know. The Catholic Church has done some good research on it, but we don't have excellent answers. Barna Research uh, recently released a pretty comprehensive study of the, of the life of American pastors, and unfortunately, they sidestepped the issue. Um, they did things about overall wellness, but they didn't pinpoint mental health, especially depression. 
So we don't have good, reliable information. My guess is that the pastors as a group, you all, nationally, are at least as depressed as the average person, simply because of what I said before, that there's a tendency to hide, to pretend, and to shield ourselves and others from how we're feeling. So we don't know, but I'm guessing it's maybe 6 to 10 percent. Now, another interesting statistic is 15 percent. Well, what's 15 percent? It's the number of people that in their adult life will never have to go through a major depressive episode. Only 15% of people will go through their entire adult life and never struggle with clinical depression. I find that interesting, fascinating, and I also find it and feel jealous because I'm not one of those 15%, and I don't know how you feel and how you identify, but only 15% are ever going to get through this scot-free. So the rest of us schmoes are going to go through one or more clinical episodes, and these episodes, by definition, last at least two weeks. So if you've downloaded the forms that we made available on the website, you have a list in front of you of depressive symptoms. Otherwise, you can see the, uh, what we've put up on the screen for you. But these are the nine symptoms. If you're listening to a podcast, I want you to simply count and see how many of these apply to you. And I'm going to go through them at medium speed so that you can count as we go. How many of these do you have? Number one, do you feel sad and depressed most of the day? Do you feel sad and depressed most of the day? Number two, do you feel lethargic or more lethargic than normal? You're tired, no energy, you just cannot get the energy that you want and need. Number three, technical name is anhedonia. The root of that word is hedonism. So it means the inability to experience pleasure or barely an ability to experience pleasure. So the things that you used to really enjoy, maybe a hobby, doesn't seem very pleasurable anymore. Relationships, sexual intimacy, a hobby you loved, whatever it is, the thought of doing it isn't very interesting and actually engaging in the activity isn't very interesting. It just doesn't feel fulfilling anymore. Memory and concentration issues, and this would be more than just normal aging. As a middle-aged person, I'd say, well, yeah, I have that all day long. But we're talking about significant gaps, forgetting basic information, or just feeling foggy mentally. So memory and concentration issues. Accident proneness, beyond what is normal for you. So some of us are a little accident prone. I'm a little accident prone. But when we get depressed, our reaction time slows down. We find that people who are depressed start bumping into things more, and they start having more car accidents, just because their reaction times slow down, they're not paying attention, and they're really tired. An obvious one, maybe the most obvious one, is suicidal ideation. And this is more than just a passing thought that most of us have a few times in our life where you just get worn down and you think, oh, Lord, just come get me. It's more than that. This is when you begin to actually have an idea that takes shape. And we apply three simple letters to that to determine how serious that ideation is. And the three letters are P-A-M, picture a PAM spray bottle, plan, access, and motivation. When we start checking off those three letters, they become, suicidal ideation becomes more important and more dangerous. But suicidal ideas is always a critical piece of this puzzle. Self-esteem and self-confidence. All of us struggle from time to time with drops in self-esteem and self-confidence, but in depression, it tends to drop and stay depressed or stay de-elevated. So suddenly we can't seem to get up in front of people anymore. We can't seem to lead a meeting. We're very fragile in terms of self-esteem and self-confidence. Hypersomnia and insomnia. We're having difficulty sleeping or we sleep too much. And the last one, weight fluctuation. That's out of the norm, that's not explained. So weight fluctuation. Now, there were nine symptoms there. So I want you to think back, how many did you check off? I'll read them again quickly. Sad and depressed, lethargic, anhedonia, memory and concentration issues, accident prone, suicidal ideas, self-esteem and self-confidence, sleep disturbances, and weight fluctuation. So here's the breakdown. If your answer was out of the nine, you have a total of zero, one, or two, you're in good shape. Uh, there's very mild disruption. Three and four, we start to have a little bit of concern. That's a small yellow flag. Five and up, starts getting into the actual category called clinical depression. Five or more of these for more than two weeks puts you into the technical description 
of clinical depression. So zero and one, not a problem, even up to two. Three and four, we start to see a yellow flag. Five and up, it's a red flag. Now, no matter what your answer is, no matter how many you checked off, suicidal ideation is the most important of all. So let me step aside for a second and say this. If today you recognize, when I talked about PAM, that you've been struggling and you've been thinking about a plan, you have access to a plan, and you're feeling some motivation, today is the day to get some help. Don't put it off. Talk to your supervisor, talk to your therapist, talk to a medical doctor to see what options are gonna work best for you. Maybe you need to begin treatment immediately. You might to be, need to be in the hospital for a few days to check blood levels, to check your thyroid, to check your iron levels. Sometimes this is organic and sometimes it's physical, but that is a very serious issue if, if we're having suicidal thoughts and we're starting to entertain those thoughts. Regardless of the score, I want you to know these nine issues and the handout that associates is something that's good for your files because as pastors, you know how often you're talking to somebody who's struggling with depression. So I would encourage you to try to commit these nine to memory so that you can sort of check them off when you're talking to people. I encourage you to do that and keep those close at hand. So again, 6% of your folks are struggling. 6% of pastors, maybe more, are struggling. And 85% of us are going to go through these episodes at least once. We also know that once you go through one of these major depressive episodes, you're much more likely to go through one or more again during your lifetime. Now, I want to go back and mention the two-week the two-week part of the definition. Why is that so important? When we're down for a day or two, it's no big deal. When we're down for a whole week, we can recover pretty easily. But research has shown us consistently the last 30 to 40 years, brain research, that once our feelings and brain and body and mind get depressed for 14 days, our brain chemistry changes significantly. Some research indicates it starts changing as early as one day, which is not a great thought. But it certainly changes at about day 14. So when we hit two weeks, the brain has a much harder time recycling itself and rebalancing itself and our mood. So remember that. One day is no big deal. A whole week is not a concern. When we start getting to around day 12, 13, and 14, that is clinically very important and significant. So if you're a journaler, you might want to just make notes about how your mood is and keep track of how many days. Just something to be aware of. In considering depression and the work that you all do as pastors, I've been working for the past 10 years or so on a model that we're beginning to test now. In fact, this presentation is a part of a tour that we're going to be doing this next 18 months in churches on the West Coast to gather data so that we can publish an article or series of articles about the current condition of pastors, professional pastors, and their struggle with or dealings with depression. So I've put together this sort of developmental model for pastors, the average pastor, that asks the question, does the work of pastoring contribute to depression? And I've identified nine factors that increase the likelihood that one might be struggling with depression. So I call them the nasty nine. They're not yet scientifically backed up, but there is some proof in the research that some of these are probably contributing to the depression. So in the next segment, we're going to start unpacking the nasty nine. We'll be looking at each of them one by one. And then we'll be spending most of our time on the last of those nine. So I look forward to talking more about it in the next segment. Thank you.